2 Peter chapter 1. I'll be reading from there in just a moment. 2 Peter chapter 1. As we have another of our graduating students or completing their study students or whatever we really call it. Um, I tell you, I've been really excited about introducing our speaker for a long time, as long as I've known that he was going to be speaking today, asked me to speak. He's probably the out most outstanding student ever to come through Sunset, a good friend, good speaker, good person in every way, and I was so looking forward to doing that. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. <laughs> And so I'll be introducing James Rogers. <laughs> and we're really excited about James being here today, willing to fill in. I'm sure he knows. You always know when James is around. James is upbeat, he's excited, he's friendly, doesn't mind being poked fun at. He's kind, he's a servant. He's ready to soak it all in. And we look forward to hearing that. But before I continue on this little introduction uh, of the speaker, I'd like him to take a moment to introduce special people who are here visiting today to hear him speak. Good morning. I'm blessed to have my wife, Tabitha, with me, her parents, our four daughters are here, a couple of my grandsons are here. I got my friends from my family congregation from the Idaho Church of Christ and online from my, my congregation that I get to serve at the Lockett Church. Welcome to all of you. Well, James Rogers. James moved to Texas about 11 years ago, settling in Dickens. Eventually, he made his way toward Idaho. Prior to that, though, he had been a, a pastor at a denominational church, preached and taught until, as he said, I just couldn't stand it any longer because of his own spiritual convictions and how they differed from those in that denomination. He said, I decided to come to Sunset at the nudging of my wife Tabitha and the encouragement of the Idaho Church of Christ. He had previously worked in a collection agency. What would you think if James came to your door saying, pay up? <laughs> he was in that work for about 26 years, I think in California, is that right? Uh, before that, he was injured while serving in the Marine Corps and is retired from the Marine Corps. Now. He was asked about, and we're always asking our speakers about those who influenced them to come, and of course he mentioned his wife Tabitha, uh, but there were others. Uh, <clears throat> she gently was persuading him through the time, but he mentions also Bill Driscoll, who is a 76 graduate, his brother-in-law cousin, Larry Farlander, who is also a graduate, I think, in 79. His sister-in-law, Dee Dee Farlander, who is an AIM graduate. And then besides that, there was Jeff Carey, David Burton, Sonny Lee, the late Sonny Lee, J.D. English, they were all strong encouragers from the Idaho Church. Also, he mentions Tommy Bailey from the Spur Church of Christ, who was uh, another one who had an influence on him coming here. You're around James, you know he's got a lot of joy, he's a man of perspective. He takes difficulties with a real heart for God and seems to have those in perspective. One that I think really understands, James 1 verse 2, count it all joy when you face various trials. He says his biggest joy has been learning proper hermeneutics. Um, that has given him many aha moments during his journey especially grateful for Ed and Victor and their classes that helped in that way. He's also grateful and his journey is becoming a gospel preacher for his homiletic studies here. He says his trial really has been working, uh, trying to work full time with the Lockett Church of Christ while also maintaining his studies here. But he's done well. One of the things I think we all like about James is he's a learner. He has a deep desire to learn. And he gives his assignments a great deal of effort. He is not content with just getting by, just doing the minimum. And when his paper comes back with marks on it, especially green ones, he goes to his teacher not to argue or complain, but say, help me out. What have I missed here? He's constantly in search of learning and also applying what he's learned. He's an encourager. 
has a zeal for the Word of God. He loves sharing the Word of God with others and challenging, challenging them to do the same. Upon graduation, he intends to continue working with the Lockett Church of Christ, which is near Vernon. Listen to me as I read. Please read along. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied unto you. James, come preach the word. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, we will fight our country's battles on the, in the air and land and sea. First to fight for right and freedom to keep our nation strong. You know, part of, part of the Marine Corps hymn, you know, it's, it is the summer of 1980, and I know you AIM guys weren't even thought of yet. And even some of the students here at sunset might not have even been born yet. But after a night of drinking, after graduating from high school, the next day I get up and I go to what used to be called the AFE station, and, and I enter, get introduc inducted to the Marine Corps. And in going to the Marine Corps, you know, we get on a bus with 63 other people, and there's another bus right behind us with 63 people on it, and we get to the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, California, and the first thing we have is somebody coming in there yelling at us, screaming at us, telling us to get off the bus and stand on these yellow footprints. Little did we know how much our life was really going to change. You know, see, I... I joined the Marine Corps, you know, a year before I had not entered. I had to finish high school and everything, and I was only 17 when I signed up, and I needed my parents' permission to enter the Marine Corps. And I remember my dad said he would do it, but he said, you know what, you don't have the, you don't have the diligence, you don't have the perseverance to make it, so yeah, I'll sign for you to do it, but I don't think that you're going to make it. You know, and it really made me think about diligence. It really made me think about diligence. And you know that diligence takes deliberate effort. And when I think about diligence, one of the stories in the Bible that comes to my mind is from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, the story of the persistent widow and the unrighteous judge. Oh, she just wanted justice. And she kept going to the judge asking for justice. And he finally, not because... He believed her, not that he really wanted to do anything. He just wanted her to go away, and he ended up giving her justice because she was wearing him out. You see, diligence takes effort, and we have everything we need to be diligent. In 2 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse number 3, it says, Seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life, and godliness through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption of the world that is in this world by Lust. You know, verse number three kind of became a real life verse to me. You know, I mentioned that in 1980 when I entered the Marine Corps, that the night before I entered the Marine Corps that I had been quite drunk. Well, my journey with alcohol and drugs continued for quite a few years after, after entering the Marine Corps. And I remember when somebody told me I didn't have to live like this, that if I would return to God, that I would believe what God's word said, that he would give me everything I needed for life and godliness. See, he took me from being a slave to drugs and alcohol and the lusts of this world and made me a free man in Christ. He, his divine power granted me everything. The same thing that he grants you that are his. He gave us freedom, freedom from the things that enslave us to this world, 
freedom to serve him. In that he also gave a desire to be diligent, to put forth the effort for true knowledge of him. Ron mentioned that I that I used to pastor in a in a denominational church and you know in don't get me wrong, I love sharing the word of God, but it got to be a point where it got to be an issue where I, I couldn't openly share the truth of the gospel, the response to the gospel. And I remember sitting down years ago with, with Tommy and Peggy across our dinner table with some denominational preachers and stuff, having this conversation. Little did I know that it wasn't going to be much longer until I would come to sunset. He has granted us his precious and magnificent promises. He sent his son. What precious gift he gave us. He sent his son to set us free from the bonds of, of sin. And he has given us magnificent promises. See, you know, diligence takes effort. And knowing that we have all these things that we've talked about back in verses 3 and 4, it says, now for this very reason, knowing that you have all the things that you need, knowing that he's given you everything for life and godliness, now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control and in your self-control perseverance and in your perseverance godliness and in your godliness brotherly kindness and in your brotherly kindness love see it starts with diligence it takes effort if we're going to share in the divine nature of God and it started with faith and I'm not talking about just a faith I'm talking about the faith the faith, the saving faith that brought you into the body of Christ. It's not your parents' faith. It's not your brothers and sisters' faith. It's not your neighbor's faith. It's not the evangelist's faith that shared the good news with you. It's the faith that you came to believe, that you obeyed, and that you now sit in this place today or you, you watch online today. It's your faith. It's your faith. It's a growing faith because we're called to continue to grow. It's a faith that knows that you have everything for life and godliness. From faith, when I look at faith, when I think about faith, how can you stay away from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1? It, it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Evidence of things not seen. See, faith isn't always something that you can put your hand on. It's not something that you can touch, but it's something that you have in you that's a part of your essence. So we go from, we go from that faith that, that saved us, that brought us into the body of Christ to some of the characteristics that I've mentioned here in verses 5 through 7 of the one that wants to share in the divine nature. First, first thing that was there was moral excellence. Moral excellence is a synonym for the word integrity. To be a person of integrity, when I think of integrity, I think of Job. You know, in a couple of good verses there, Job chapter 2, verses 3, where he holds fast his integrity. In verse 27, in verse, in verse number 5, where he says that he has not given up his integrity. You know, see, integrity is something that, as Christians, we should have. Because if we don't have integrity, we don't have anything. Why would people listen to us and what we have to share if we're not people of integrity? We have to cling to that. We need to hold to that. And as we do that, from that integrity or moral excellence, as the Scripture says, we add knowledge. Oh, this is more true knowledge that we're to add. You know, when you look in the book of Colossians in chapter 2 and verse number 2, 
true knowledge of the mystery, and that mystery is Jesus Christ. It's no longer a mystery. It's been revealed to us. It's been shown to us. It's given us everything to know what to share, how to share in the divine nature of Jesus Christ, how to have life and godliness. That true nature, that true knowledge that we have helps us to understand God's word more. And as we continue on with this list, the next thing that's listed is self-control. Self, to be self-controlled says to control oneself or one's action. You know, I wasn't a person of self-control, and still sometimes I have issues with self-control. You can tell from my weight. But um, self-control was something that I learned that I had because of Jesus Christ, because of what he did for me. I have that. He has given it to me. When we look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse 23, it's a part of the fruit of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 25, anyone that competes in a race has or exercises self-control. We here had to make that decision to come here and we've had to practice lots of self-control or self-discipline to succeed here at Sunset International Bible Institute. But it takes self-control just to be a Christian. It's not just for us. It's, it's for everyone. And from self-control, it says, and in your perseverance. See, I can't persevere for you. I can't even persevere for my wife as much as I'd like to sometimes. But it has to be your perseverance. You have it. Because God has given you everything you need for life and godliness. God has given you the faith that you need. God has given you the things for moral excellence so that you can persevere. And when I think of perseverance, I, I think of Romans chapter 5 and verses 3 through 5 where it talks tribulations bring about perseverance. There's all sorts of things that we're going to have to, to go through. There's all sorts of tribulations that we have to walk through. Some of the things that walking through is, have transpired, well, here at sunset. And I'm forever grateful for the men of the Idaloo Church that were there for me during a really difficult time. For some, a difficult time, the beginning of last summer, where... You know, and I wish everybody could have this. I had a total of 48 hours uninterrupted time with Gibby Gilbert in a car. Ha, ha, ha. Very little cell reception. So we had some wonderful time where he was able to share with me, to encourage me, to help me to learn about perseverance and about godliness. Because the next quality is godliness. And when I think of godliness, I think of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 8. It says, godliness is profitable in all things. That means in my tribulations, godliness is profitable. You know, in my self-control, godliness is profitable. In your life, godliness is profitable. To, be God, to have a God-like quality it's a part of our transformation process as it talks about in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 2. It's a part of our maturity process as we see in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 13. But the list doesn't stop there. It goes on and from godliness we're to add brotherly kindness. Well, that's, there's a pretty easy explanation to brotherly kindness. It's to love the brethren. You know, and I don't know about you, sometimes it could be a little bit tough to love the brethren. Especially when, you know, they do things that are ungodlike. But it doesn't change the fact of what we need to do. We need to love the brethren because the very last quality that it talks about is love. Unconditional, sacrificial love for one another. This list, it, it takes a lot of effort, but it results in maturity. And maturity has its 
benefits. You know, for if you're, adding to, if you're adding to this list and you're being transformed by this list that we've just looked at, you will be maturing. You will be increasing in the things that we've looked at. You will not be useless. You will not be fruitless. Isn't that why we're here? Because we want to be useful to the kingdom of God. Useful with the true knowledge, the mystery of Jesus Christ that you have in you. Useful with the true knowledge. And not only that, to be fruitful. Oh, how we can be fruitful is that we take the time to share the good news with other people. We'll be fruitful in the true knowledge of Him. And it takes effort. I couldn't tell you last summer when, when I got back from a, a trip to Montana and our church said, James, we want you to evangelize all summer. And it wasn't what my plan was for the summer, but it's what God's plan was. And it took me out of my comfort zone and he put me in a whole lot of time sitting in McDonald's at 6 o'clock in the morning trying to meet some of the men. It put me in places in the evenings trying to meet people, but it netted a lot of, a lot of Bible studies and a baptism when taking a guy that was addicted to drugs that I could really relate to, while taking him to a recovery house, stopping along the way at a church of Christ between Vernon and Abilene and baptizing him into the Lord's body. What an awesome, awesome thing it is, but it takes diligence. You know, if we don't add to these things, if we're not diligent, we need to be really careful because it goes on in verse number 9 and it says, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from former sins. We don't want to lack diligence because we might forget that we were purified. We were purified. Your purification, as it talks about, and maybe just a little reminder this morning, and better than me, how about if I just use God's word? From 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 20, it says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last days for the sake of you. Whose sake? Your sake. Who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and who gave him glory so that your faith, again, it's your faith, and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of a seed that is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. My prayer, my hope for everybody here is that you have a love for the word of God and that you put that word of God in you. And that you use that word of God to prick hearts, to change hearts, that they too can make a decision to follow Jesus. You know, this list, the list that we looked at back in verses, you know, 5 through 7, they were pretty good. But, you know, if we don't add these things, if we don't add these things to us, if we don't put these things into action, you know, what does it look like? That we need to be more diligent in everything. And not only did we talk about our purification, We have our perseverance that we go through. I don't want you guys to forget that you have everything that you need for life and godliness. He gave it to you when you obeyed the gospel. He'll give it to the people that you share the gospel message with that respond to the gospel. You have everything that you need. What do we need to do? We need to be more diligent. And we need to put these things in action. We need to practice these things. The things that we practice, and I'll go over it very quickly. Faith. 
moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, with perseverance and godliness, brotherly kindness and love. How do you practice these things? You put them in action. You see, I mentioned that in 1980 I, I entered the Marine Corps. It took a lot of diligence, it took a lot of effort, it took a lot of perseverance, but I graduated from the Marine Corps, and you can't see it there because that's not really the picture of my graduating class because there'd be a guy in a cast in there because I had my arm broken when I was in boot camp. You know, it was real easy to pick me out in pictures. And if perseverance was beneficial to me when I entered to the Marine Corps, perseverance is beneficial today as we study God's Word together. Perseverance is good for us for tomorrow because we know, we know that we have entrance in the eternal kingdom of God. And there's people that need to be reminded of that all the time. One of the greatest things I wanted to hear was the title of United States Marine. Oh, how I wanted to hear that. I couldn't wait until graduation day when we earned that title of United States Marine. But that title is nothing compared to the title that we hold today called Christian. Make the deliberate effort to be a Christian.